I remember it was 1983, and it seemed like my first exposure to what you would call Christmas chaos. There was a new toy on the market called the Cabbage Patch Doll, and every parent was passionate about getting this Cabbage Patch doll for their children. Me, I was probably 12 years old. I didn't care about Cabbage Patch dolls. But I remember watching on TV with disbelief, seeing grown adults act like spoiled children trying to get these Cabbage Patch dolls for their children. And just when you would think that's an anomaly, that it was 1996 when we were introduced to the Tickle Me Elmo doll, and we had the exact same frenzy all around the country. And when you look at that and you see this play out as you're growing up, you go, boy, what? You ask yourself, what causes parents to do this? And I remember asking someone, why do parents do that? Someone said, it's because they love their children. Now, to me, that sounds like a really weird kind of love. Um, In this holiday season, we're inviting everyone to adopt a, a... countercultural view of what Christmas is. There's a beauty and a power in this Christmas season that we can capture, and we've been through this series of Christmas conspiracy where we've been inviting people to take Christmas back to the heart of what this season can be by focusing on the baby Jesus and God sending his son to earth for our redemption in this ultimate act of true love. As we have been through this series, we've looked at the importance of being a, having a worshipful heart, and we worship with all we are because we are created as worshipers, and we're worshiping somebody. Everything we are is always worshiping something, and we are inviting people to worship Jesus because that's when we put our trust and our hope and our energy in worshiping Jesus, that's where we find our true peace. Then we invited everyone to spend less. of people typically go into significant debt buying presents for Christmas. And there's a meaning behind Christmas that's way more than buying gifts. And then we invited you to give more. And that's give more of yourself. Give more of your presence in the moment when you're with your family. Be present. Put away distractions. Enjoy the time today together. And the last part of this series is that we get to love all. This new kind of love, this love that Jesus ushers in and invites us to is truly countercultural. It's a conspiracy that we're even talking this way because society would have us go in a different direction for a different reason. What I want to do today is read a passage. It's not a traditional Christmas passage. But it's in the book of Luke. It's in a a couple other Gospels, but we're going to look at Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 56. And this is where Jesus heals a little girl at a father's request. But he also offers healing to way more groups of people than just this little girl. And so we're going to look at that. And this is all rooted in our scripture focus for today and just the anchor of our life with Jesus in John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. The purpose of God sending his son is because of his love for us that saves us. It's not a condemnation, it's a saving. And it's important that we remember that that is the purpose, that is what we celebrate. He came to save us through Jesus. Now, let's unpack what that means, okay? Luke 8, 40 through 56. Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years. No one could heal her. She came up behind him and and touched the edge of his cloak and immediately her bleeding stopped. 
Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power had gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, a synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother this teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just believe, and she'll be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the father's child and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead, but he took her by the hand and he said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them, give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Now, on the surface, this sounds like the story of a man in desperation comes to this this healer, Messiah King, who had just performed a bunch of miracles, and he says, my daughter is sick. What I want to do is look a little deeper at everyone represented in this story. Look at the characters. There's at least five characters or groups of people here that we can identify. There's Jairus, who's the religious leader in the community. Now, the fact that he was a leader in the synagogue meant that he was part of the group that was persecuting Jesus. So he stood as someone who was not necessarily grouped with the people that was friendly with Jesus, coming in desperation, asking Jesus to heal his daughter. Have you ever been in that role of Jairus? Have you ever been the one that is standing, knowing that you have not been faithful, you're not on the team Jesus, that you know that you stood as the enemy of him, but you're desperate and you're crying out to him for his mercy and his help? Maybe in this story, you're the outcast woman who had an illness for 12 years, she was bleeding for 12 years, and nothing could have healed her. Now, the fact that she was bleeding and <clears throat> indicates that she would not have been able or, or she would have been prevented by the religious leaders, by the Jairus, that she would not be able to go into the temple to identify with her people, to identify the core identity of the Jewish people was that they were the people of the temple. And she would not have been able to go in there for 12 years. Maybe in this story, you're that woman. Maybe you're the one who feels like you've been cast aside by the church, by God's people, that you've been neglected or ignored, that your true brokenness has been something that has caused you to be rejected by God's people. Maybe you're part of the crowd that was pressing in on Jesus. Think about that. Why was this crowd gathering and pressing in on Jesus? They were leaning in and pressing in, I believe, because they needed to see for themselves this Messiah, wondering. They're on the outside looking in. They're not necessarily sick or bleeding or dying or begging God for anything, but they're pressing in and looking and they're wondering and they're hoping, is this miracle maker the Savior? I want to see. I want to see. Maybe you're one of the skeptics that were laughing at him when he says, hey, they're not, they're, not, they're not dead. She's not dead. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. Maybe you scoff at the idea that Jesus could heal. Maybe you think that's silly. Maybe you mock Jesus. Or maybe you're the sick daughter who's just is depending on a miracle. Nothing you can do. You're just waiting. Look at all these characters, and let's look at how Jesus responds to them, 
How does Jesus respond to, the, to Jairus, the, the persecutor uh, of, of his cause, the one who's part of the group that would reject him? Coming to him in humility, and, and you could almost say probably a little of, level of humiliation, submitting to the authority of this, this rabbi, this healer, saying, will you please come? How does Jesus respond? Well, here's what the love of Jesus looks like. He honored him. And he gave him hope. And he says, I will go with you. That's the love of Jesus to the person who stands on the outside and and looks and criticizes and maybe condemns Jesus. When they come and ask for help, his response is love. Yes, I will come. What about the outcast woman who's bleeding? Not only does her touch heal her, he restores her to dignity. If you'll notice, he calls her daughter. (laughs) Even though she hasn't been able to go into the temple to be God's people, to be part of the family of God, he restores her by calling her daughter. And then he gives her her dignity back by saying, hey, you have been to all the medics and all the doctors to try to be healed and try to be restored of this thing. They have all rejected you. But it is your belief that has healed you. He gave her dignity, said the power is in you. You have dignity to be restored. You have, all it takes is you and me. All those people that rejected you, you don't need them to come to me. And he says, daughter, and restores her to dignity and righteousness. That is, that's the love of Jesus. What about the crowd that's pressing in on Jesus going, I need to know, is this a Messiah? Is this he? He lets them see this miracle and he declares it for all. When he, Jesus says, who touched me? He knew, but he wanted to give the gift of love to everyone to see that there's a miracle happening here. There is restoration and redemption even for this outcast. And that told everyone looking on that, yes, if it is for her, it is for me too. The love he had for the masses that were pressing in against him. And, and then what, what were the masses pressing in against him doing? They were delaying him from going to heal the girl. And so the people from the house of Jairus come out and say, hey, it's too late. This delay has caused her death. Boy, that had to be frustrating. And that leads to the skeptics. You can kind of read that there's this skepticism when they say, you know, crowd's pressing in. He stopped to heal this woman and your daughter's dead. Leave him alone. You have nothing to do with him. It's kind of like put him away. You don't need him anymore. They had no reason to believe And Jesus gives them hope and says, don't worry, she's just sleeping. And then they see she is brought back, she is healed. Where are you in this story? I would argue that we're all in different places at different times. In this story, when we approach Jesus, you've been the desperate family member, you've been the one with sickness, that has caused your rejection. Maybe it's your addiction. You've been part of the crowd, pressing in, wondering, maybe with the critical heart, but then all of a sudden you see a miracle and you're you're set free and you have hope. Maybe you're the skeptic and maybe you're the girl, completely dependent on the love of others and the love of Jesus. This season, when we look at the coming of Jesus, it's this celebration that he has come to set us free. The father in this story is set free to have hope and set free to, be in, to have his daughter healed. The woman is set free, the, the sick woman is set free to be restored to her community and to celebrate and to dance and to love and to, to do all the things that she can do in her community and her family. The onlookers are set free to believe because they have a miracle, they have something to believe in, they have some reason to have hope. The skeptics are set free from the, a spirit of condemnation to a spirit of awe and wonder so they can believe. And you and I, are set free. So we celebrate the coming of Jesus because it is the love of Jesus that sets us free. Sets us free to do what? It sets us free to love. It sets us free to hope. 
It sets us free to receive joy, and it sets us free to dance. It sets us free to forgive. It sets us free. The love of Jesus sets us free. You don't owe your suffering one moment more of mourning. You don't owe an offense that someone has done against you. You don't owe that anything. You're set free to forgive that. And we can trust that justice belongs to God. He'll take care of that. We are set free to love. And that's why we celebrate this season. That's why we celebrate the coming of Jesus, because we are set free to love. Oh, that's such good news. God with us empowers us to take the love that has been given us, the unconditional love that has set us free, and we get to love all. The Bible tells us who to love. We love our family. We love ourselves. We love our neighbors. We love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We love those who see things differently than we do. And we love our enemies. And when that just seems too hard, remember, if you believe, you will be healed and you are set free to love. Do you believe that the love of Jesus is unconditional and sets you free? Because if you believe that, you can't believe that the love of Jesus is unconditional only for you, because then by nature, that's conditional. The love of Jesus is unconditional, and it changes us into people who strive to be unconditional lovers. We are free to love. We are set free to love all. So that's why we take this morning and this moment, and we celebrate God come to earth to set us free from all the things that would stop us from living free. Anxiety, fear, judgment, condemnation. So let's continue in worship and celebrate the coming of this baby, of this king, of the ultimate expression of unconditional love that restores us and strengthens us and empowers us to go and love all.